Hello, in this video we're going to review a bit from last time, and I also want to take a, a step back and kind of think about all the different ways we could write classes uh, to represent graphs. There's kind of a lot of different ways we could do it, and, um, and, and so I think by kind of looking at the big picture we can make those comparisons uh, from the beginning. So first the review part. Um, here we have a method that we implemented last time. I'm not really showing it inside of the class, but what we're doing is we're trying to search in some sort of tree structure recursively for some sort of target, right? And so then I have this node. And, and what I might imagine is that I first call this on the, the root of my tree, right? Whatever node is the root. And then it's trying to make recursive calls so that it can basically see if that um, value is anywhere, right? So here I have a picture of what the, the tree looks like and you can see there's different values and different nodes. And, and, and kind of depending on, um, you know, what value I'm searching for, I might have to check more or less nodes before I have an answer. I mean, if I'm if I'm looking for something that's not even in the tree, well then guess what, I end up having to look at uh, everything, right? So, so when I'm looking at this, it, it's really, I'm doing two recursive calls on the same line of code, uh, but they're between the or, and what we're gonna see is something called short circuiting. So when I do this first contains, it's going to call that first, and if that's true, if the part before the or is true, uh, then it doesn't really matter what is after it, right? Because um, true or true is true, and true or false is true. I guess true or anything is true. So, so if this returns true, I'll never come down to this one. If this one is false, I have false or, well, then I have to run that second piece to actually see what happens. Okay, so maybe I have a few questions here, uh, but maybe first, let's just imagine um, if I was searching for something that doesn't exist. Um, I was searching for something that didn't exist, maybe like um, the letter M, for example. In what order would I, would I check things if I was trying to starting from the root? So the very first place I look, will look will be up here. And then based on this code, I check the left-hand side first. Right, so the second place I'll check is B. And before my call for B even returns, B is running the same thing. And B is going to check its two children. Right, so the third thing I would check would be this down here, Y. The fourth thing would be X. Uh, eventually I did over here, right, after all that had returned. And then finally over here. And, and so that one would be the order uh, of what would happen if I was searching for something that doesn't um, exist in the tree. And, um, and it turns out that when I'm searching for, say, Z, um, it's gonna be just as slow, right? Because that's really kind of in that last place I check. So I'll return true, but only after I've already looked at looked at everything, right? So I'm gonna circle, circle six there. Okay, so what if I'm searching for C? Um, again, I can kind of just read off the answer after I figure out this ordering. The real challenge is that I go deep on the left-hand side before I get to C. So, so even though C is pretty near the root, guess what, it doesn't matter um, because, well, I'm gonna kind of check over everything over here. I'm gonna end up checking X before I get to C, right? So I'm just gonna make a note of that, that we end up checking X first. And eventually we're gonna learn strategies, right? I mean, right now I'm kind of doing this, uh, what I call search order. Um, we're gonna eventually learn something called breadth first search where I can go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that would help us find things near the root um, kind of first, right? Okay, what if I what if I am looking for C? Well, what will happen then? Well, eventually when I get to here, right, so let's say I'm calling this on C, which is like the fifth thing I do, right? So I'm calling this on C, you know, I can actually return, I can actually return before I even have to do this recursive call. Right, so I actually am never gonna actually have to look at C's children. And, and so the answer on this one is just, well, I would have to look at five nodes. Okay, uh, let's head over here. And um, on the right, I have some sort of Venn diagram showing you the different uh, kind of categories and subcategories of graphs. I mean, most broadly, a graph is anything with nodes and some edges between those nodes. Um, We've seen different kinds of edges, right? Like we've seen, um, you know, maybe I have two nodes that look like this and, and the edge would be that. That would be undirected if I have an arrow. 
like that, that would be an example of a, of a directed graph, right? So not all, um, not all graphs have directed edges, but some do. So a directed graph is a kind of graph. The way I'm putting that over here is G is, is graph. DG is a directed graph. Um, what is a DAG? So a DAG uh, is a subcategory of that. So you kind of see as I add more rules, it's kind of fewer, uh, fewer graphs fall into that category, right? That's why this is a smaller circle, right? Every DAG is a directed graph. Uh, but there are some directed graphs that are not DAGs, right? Um, so that means I have to be acyclic, um, right? There's no cycles. Um, what about a, a tree? A tree is a type of DAG, I'm just writing T here, that has exactly one root. And except for the root, uh, every node has exactly one parent. So... You can kind of imagine things that are DAGs, but not trees, right? I mean, I guess if I had two islands, that would be a DAG. Um, if I had things that kind of, uh, you know, if I have four nodes that are like this, right? if I kind of branch out and then come back together, um, that would be an example of a DAG that is not a tree, right? So there's lots of DAGs that aren't, aren't trees, right? But every tree is a DAG. Um, these next things are kind of defining different structures that um, have additional constraints on trees, right? So binary, binary means two. And so a binary tree is just a regular tree that has all these other constraints. And then the additional rule that nodes have at most two children. Um, they might have one child, they might have zero child. If it's zero child, then it's a leaf. Um, a linked list has the property that you know, every node has at most one child. And so, of course, you know, if you have at most one child, you it's also true that you have at most two children. And so I've drawn linked list over here as a subcategory of binary tree, right? Binary, some binary trees um, will have nodes with two children. That would not be a linked list, but otherwise uh, it is. And a linked list is kind of just like a chain of nodes, right? Where each one points to the next. Other thing over here is the binary search tree, and that's really um, kind of today's talk and talk, um, the upcoming videos. And that one doesn't so much have to do with the structure of the nodes and, and values uh, of the nodes and edges. What it really has to do with is the values inside of each node, right? So the metadata. And, and so you can imagine any binary tree, and you can imagine looking at the values in there and figuring out, are the values arranged such that this thing is a binary search tree. And, um, and, and so m maybe let me kind of um, draw something like this. So I may have some sort of value here, like maybe five, and maybe that's my root, and then I might have a left and right child. And, and maybe there's some sort of um, node over here, maybe it's like three. And this whole area over here, right? I mean, I might have lots of lots of nodes over here. And the rule, right, is that everything in that left subtree is less than that parent, right? So everything over here would be less than five, and everything over here would be greater than, than five, right? And, and this is a recursive rule, right? So um, it's when I'm talking about left and subtrees and right subtrees, I'm just talking about the parent, it doesn't have to be the root. So if I have three here, well, guess what, everything you know, if I have another subtree over here, all these things would be less than three. All these things would be greater than three. And if you think about it, that actually kind of narrows down a lot what could go here, right? Because it's in the right subtree of three, so it has to be bigger than three. It's in the left subtree of five, so it would have to be less than five. So I guess this value here, anything that would be in here would have to be between uh, three and five. Let me just clean that up a bit. Okay, so that's going to be our focus for today. Um, so, so kind of looking at all of these things, we can talk about this idea of, um, weak connectedness. Uh, weak connectedness only really makes sense in the context of directed graphs, because, uh, by definition, when I'm asking whether something uh, is weakly connected, I immediately say, um, ignore the direction of, of the edges, right? So, so let's say I'm trying to figure out if this thing is, is weakly connected. What I would do is I would ignore it and I try to get this picture down here. And then I'd say, well, is this thing connected? 
And, and of course, this thing is connected because, you know, wherever I start, I can get to any other node, right? It's kind of, there are no islands, right? I can get around however I want. And so all of these structures, kind of given the fact that they, there's just like one root and everything is kind of branching off from that, um, all of these things will always be uh, weakly connected. In general, they won't be strongly connected, right? So this is an example of a tree. It's not connected in the strong sense because I can't get from D to A. Uh, for that matter, I can't get from B to A or for B to C. So if there's just like one pair of nodes where I can't get more from one to the other, it's not fully connected. But it is weakly connected because I can get anywhere if I if I ignore the directions. So when we're building all these different kinds of graphs, like the first thing you always do when you're building a graph is you think about what your node class will be looking like. And, and so here I have kind of three different node classes and they each have different attributes, right? I mean, I might have a next attribute. Um, here I have a list of children, that's my attribute. Um, here I have two attributes, a left child and a right child. And, and so maybe at least initially, I want you to think about for, um, for let's say these three, these three right here, which of these, which of these three matches with, with which of these three over here? And I'm just gonna give you a, a, a moment to think about that, so pause me until you have an answer and, and then play again. Okay, so let's start with, um, let's start with uh, linked less. Maybe that's the easiest one. So it's a tree such that nodes each have at most one child. So either have zero children or one children. And, um, and so as I'm kind of looking over here, I'm like, well, I could have two children here, any number of children here. This is the only one where I, I kind of have, you know, exactly one. I have exactly one child, right? So this linked list goes up here and that is connected to A. A uh, binary tree where I have the most two children. Um, well, that's the one on the bottom here, right? Right, I have my left child and my right child. And, and in both of these cases, right, I, I always say at most. So, I mean, this could be none, in which case I have no children. One or more of these could remain none, so I could have zero or one children. Uh, but neither of these designs, A or C, would allow more than that. And that's why they're kind of these more uh, restricted things. Um, a tree in general, right, um, you know, I could have any number of children for a node. And, and so I might have, I'll just kind of draw this from this one, this one right here, where I have any number of children. And, and, and now just one thing I want to kind of point out, right, is that I'm just talking about the attributes now. What attributes would I have for each of these cases? Uh, but that's not the whole picture, right? I mean, when I'm doing this, there's nothing really kind of stopping me from having two nodes be each other's children, right? Like um, B is the child of A and A is the child of B, right? So just that I have these attributes here, I mean, that limits the flexibility somewhat, but you know, if I want to kind of use this for a tree, I'm going to have to have other code that's kind of careful about what I put in this list of children um, so that I actually end up with a tree in the end. So what about these other three? If I want to have like a DAG or a directed graph or, or kind of a graph in general, well, it turns out that these all also have this style, just like that, right? Um, I'll have to be uh, kind of more careful, like if I have a more restrictive type, right? Like tree is more uh, restrictive than DAG, which is more restrictive than directed graph. Um, if it's more restricted, I'll have to kind of be careful about what I put in that list of children, right? Um, what about what about if I kind of want a graph in general? Um, and let's say I want a graph that is not necessarily directed. Um, it turns out that even that I could use this design. And and, and the way that I can represent that is that whenever I have a, a non-directed edge between two nodes, I can represent that non-directed edge with two directed edges, right? If, if kind of, uh, you know, let me kind of draw it this way, right? So if I have A 
and I have B, um, you know, I could have a non-directed edge like that, uh, but for simplicity, what we'll often do is we'll just kind of store two edges like that, and, and we'll call those two really kind of a non-directed edge. And, and because that's so common is why, um, is why this first type of graph, right, kind of graphs in general, are also represented with this. So you can definitely see that this is kind of the most common uh, general pattern that people do. And, and honestly, right, I mean, you could use this for everything, right? I mean, uh, I could just try to be careful to make sure I never put more than two children in there. And then I could use that to represent a binary tree. What about this last case down here, a binary uh, search tree? That one also will probably usually be this design right here. And I'll just try to be careful about what my left and right children are. So we've spent a lot of time talking about node classes, and it's not unusual for that to be the only class you create when, um, when you're kind of designing graphs. Uh, now, you're also going to see cases where people might have um, separate classes for edges, right? I mean, we've been doing edges as just, well, my node has a, an attribute that refers to another node, but sometimes people actually have separate classes for that. And the main case for that is that we might have some um, edge metadata. Um, so for example, let's say we were talking about like a social network. Um, I might have a, a node for each friend and, uh, and I have an edge between them because they're friends, but I might want to remember things like, well, um, you know, when did their friendship start? Um, in which case, I need to store that information somewhere. So instead of having one node refer to another node, I'll, I'll have the first node refer to an edge object that will tell me a little bit about the relationship, and that edge object will refer to the final, um, to the final node. Maybe let me just kind of draw that to make it very clear. Right? I'll kind of have a node. You know, the simple case we've seen a lot is we'll have kind of one node uh, refers to another. But, but we're gonna have like an edge object in the middle, right? So this will refer to this, and this will refer to this. And because this is a full um, object, I can put whatever extra information in there I would like. Um, wh why do I wanna sometimes have a, a separate graph class? I have an example down here of what a graph class might look like. Um, there are different cases where this can show up. Um, when we're just having kind of only a node class, well, usually there's like one root node and, and we can use that to find all the other nodes. Um, that's not so great if my graph has multiple roots, for example, right? How can I uh, find all my multiple roots? It's kind of weird to have a few variables around um, for a single graph. It's nicer to just have one variable that refers to the graph and from there I can find all the roots. So, so it wouldn't be uncommon to have kind of a some sort of list or dictionary of, of the roots or maybe even of every node in the structure. Um, if I have some constraints, so for example, um, I don't want directed edges, I want everything to be uh, kind of bidirectional, then what I could do is I could, whenever I'm trying to make one node refer to the other, I could add another attribute back in the same direction, right? So I could have some sort of graph class and then I could add edges there between between two nodes, and, and then you can see what I can do right here, right? I can have node one uh, append a link to B and have uh, node two uh, append a link to node one, right? So that's why we might want to have a, have a graph class in kind of certain cases.